fantastic that you are here at the Cracks Pop channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. This is part four in our Snakes and Stairs series. The links for parts one, two, and three are in the description of this video for easy access in case you missed those videos or you just want to review. So let's get started. The seraphim are classified as the highest order of celestial beings. The prophet Isaiah is actually the only one in scripture to record an encounter with these beings. And he lived during the 8th century and the vision that he had of the seraphim in the temple occurred around 742 BCE. So remember from previous videos that Seraph means fiery serpent, and the seraphim are referred to as burning ones. This vision we're about to take a look at should also remind us of another person who was propelled into his destiny after an encounter with the great I am in a burning bush. Yes, you guessed it, Moses. <laughs> All right, let's look at Isaiah's experience. We're going to look at Isaiah 6, verses 1 and 2. So, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were blind. We don't really get much in the way of a description here, do we? Unlike the cherubim, who are also known as the living creatures, and they show up throughout the Bible in many places. We have great descriptions of them from the prophet Ezekiel and also from the apostle John. But, because we know that a seraph is a fiery serpent and connects us to all those serpent words we already learned about in previous videos, an image of a six-winged dragon-like creature would be really accurate. We know there's more than one seraph because of the I am, that in which makes the word in Hebrew plural, kind of like the English S makes a noun plural in English. So I'll speculate in a little bit here about how many I think might have been present. Each seraph had six queens, we can see that. And some commentators suggest that the reason they are covering their faces and feet are due to the humility in the presence of God's great glory and power. I think it's also possible that their description was not to be given. So it's really hard to find a really, in my opinion, a really great picture of the seraphim. But I thought this picture was cool. So that's why it's up on your screen. <laughs> so I think that there were three, or are, I should say, three seraphim above God's throne. And I'm not saying that there's only three in existence, but rather I think there are three that are given the special honor of being above the throne. Uh, why do I think this? Well, I think this because there are four cherubim around the throne. The cherubim are always surrounding the throne or around it, never above it. And the earth is God's footstool, and four is the number of the earth. But three is the number associated with heavenly things. And that's why seven is often symbolic of perfection of the blending of earth, which is four, and heaven, which is three. So that would give us seven celestial beings right in close proximity to God Almighty's throne. Also, 
With three seraphim, we would have six wings each, equaling nine sets of wings. And this would be the 369, which some high-level mathematicians call the 369 theory as holding all the secrets of the universe. So, uh, of course, my idea of three seraphim can't be proven. It's just what resonates with me when I pray about it and reflect on God's word and how many there can be. Let's look at what happens next. We're still in Isaiah. So this is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. That's a lot of power and vibration to make the temple shake like that during their praise to our Creator. So in Hebrew, three words in a row is very rare in Scripture. There's only a few examples of other words that were used three times in a row. But there is another throne room scene where holy, holy, holy is also happening. And this is with the living creatures, or they're also known as the cherubim. So let's look at that. And this is found in Revelation chapter four, verse eight. And it says, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. So I know there are many out there who would like to say that the seraphim and the cherubim are essentially the same celestial being, but they are not. <laughs> they both might have six wings deal in fire and sing holy, holy, holy three times, but that's about all they have in common. The living creatures have faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. The seraphim are serpentine. They're serpents. They're fiery serpents. They're, so they're not the same creature. So since God is holy, let us look at that word in a little bit more detail. So that word in Hebrew is kadosh. Kadosh. The Q is making a K sound. Kadosh. And it's the strong number 6918. And going from right to left, because Hebrew is read from right to left, we have a kuf, a dalit, a vav, and a shin. And that's making the word and it's translated sacred and holy and it comes from a verbal root which is the number 6492 and that means to consecrate and to set apart so we don't decide what's holy God does as the most sacred being he alone gets to choose what is to be holy and what is not. So now we're going to look at a verse in which God is talking to Moses. And this is when this word, Kadosh, first shows up. So we're looking at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And it says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, and out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy, and there's your 6918, Kadosh, nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. 
So I think perhaps a future video for a word study on holy might be in order. It is really important to understand what is holy, sacred, and set apart in God's sight. But for now, let's just continue with Isaiah. So he's seen Seraphim, he's seen the king himself. What is his reaction? So here we are, still in Isaiah chapter 6, this is verse 5, and he says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. No one encounters God Almighty and has a warm, fuzzy experience. (laughs) It is terrifying. A person is immediately aware of their sin, their humanity, their unworthiness. You will never find a tiptoe through the tulip moment anywhere in your Bible. (laughs) when someone encounters either God himself or even an angel or a celestial being. An encounter with the great I am is a life-changing moment. There will be a before and an after. (laughs) So Isaiah was aware of his sin and his people's sin. The sin of our mouths, of unclean lips, is actually in all of us. So here are a few sins of the mouth that the scriptures mention. Lying, gossip, fault finding, slander, foul language, bragging, flattery, talking too much, murmuring, backbiting, negativity, and the list goes on and on and on. It is the number one way in which we sin. So Isaiah's cry of being ruined is he thinks he's in imminent danger of being destroyed. But then we have Isaiah 6, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which you have taken with tongue from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So yes, the seraph used a burning coal to remove guilt and purge sin. And, you know, there are people that get hung up on the tongue part. Well, if it's a fiery bee and a fiery one, then why is it using tongues? Well, the tongues were a separation between Isaiah's sin and the seraph. So the seraph is pure and the tongues are like a buffer in between, holding the coal up to Isaiah's mouth. And can you imagine how intense this experience must have been for Isaiah. You're thinking about to die and then this flaming, fiery, celestial being comes flying to you with a burning coal and then touches your mouth. Something tells me this was not a painless experience. However, it was the transformational moment for Isaiah. So, This is the moment where Isaiah actually gets commissioned or equipped. So when God says, whom shall I send? Then Isaiah can say, send me. And God did send Isaiah as his mouthpiece, as his prophet to his people to warn them of the upcoming judgment if they did not repent. So it's a beautiful picture to see how our Heavenly Father will use his ministering spirit to serve us. Just like the Sarah served Isaiah, he thought he was about to die, but instead he got his guilt 
and his sin purged out and commissioned. So it's awesome how God does that. So in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7 it says, In speaking of the angels he says, He makes his angel spirits and his servants flames of fire. And that's exactly what the seraph did for Isaiah. This pretty much concludes our snakes and seraph series, but I'd like to add just a couple more points before we end this video. We're going to go back to Moses and that serpent on the pole. Here's another artist rendition of that. I like this one. So we remember that the serpent on the pole is actually a picture of Yeshua. And Yeshua says that he would be lifted up just as the serpent. Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. And it was an image of him destroying the enemy's power. Satan, the seraph, bite, the sting of death forever. And everyone that looked upon that copper serpent didn't die. They would live, and that poison could not kill them. And in the same way, Yeshua would draw all men to himself, and those that look to him can gain eternal life. Well, whatever happened to that copper snake? I'm glad you asked. So it was actually destroyed by King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah was a very godly king, and he was determined to destroy all idolatry in the land. We're going to go and see that. So we have Second Kings 18.4. And it says, He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the copper snake Moses had made. But up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nekushutan. So, <laughs> what a shame. Uh, this event happened nearly 500 years after Moses made that copper snake. And so King Hezekiah decided, okay, enough of this worshiping this copper snake. And the name, Nekushtan, is uh, coming from that word of copper that we learned about in another video, uh, Nekushet. And so it's a shame, but it often happens to many of us if we focus on the gift instead of the one who gave the gift or the blessing that comes to us instead of the one who blessed us, which would be God. So this finishes up the Snakes and Seraphs series. Please give a thumbs up so you can support this video and this series. I would love it if you give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because there's lots of videos that are going to be upcoming on exciting topics and you just don't want to miss them. May Heavenly Father smile down upon you and bless you in every way.